Hey everybody, Bo Prosser here, Center for Christian Education. I hope you like our new background. Give me some uh, emojis or some comments on that. Thanks to my daughter, Jamie Zimmer, for putting that together for us. And I uh, hope this helps along the way. I'll change it up from time to time so you won't get bored about it. Anyhow, uh, Bo Prosser, Center for Christian Education, Monday School. Thanks for joining me. As always, uh, just grateful that you would join me and participate with me in this ongoing Bible study. Tonight, we're looking at the Smith and Hellas Formation Lesson Outline for Sunday, August the 18th, Paul, Self-Giving Leadership. Uh, we've had some great studies this month. I hope you've uh, picked up a lot about leadership and spiritual leadership as we've gone through these weeks together. My friend Jim sent me a comment a few weeks ago after one of our lessons. He said, Bo, I love these lessons and I continually hear one word from you, one word from you. That is the word love. And um, then he says, is it really that simple? Well, Jim, I said to him, uh, some have called me the minister of love and laughter. And I believe that's what Jesus has called us to do, to keep loving and to enjoy life along the way. Uh, keep teaching, keep loving. And thanks, Jim, for the comment. And for any of you, anytime something comes up, give me a shout and I'll be happy to respond. When Jesus is asked what matters most, Jesus doesn't say, believe the right things. He doesn't say, well, if you maintain doctrinal purity and believe like everyone else. He doesn't say worship like this or attend this church. He doesn't say give a tenth. He doesn't say read your Bible or pray every day or preach the gospel to every living creature. He simply says, love God, love neighbor, love self, love, love God, love neighbor, love self. And Jim and others, it really is as simple and as challenging as that. You see, love is probably the most overused word in our language. Uh, Debbie Thomas, uh, who I quote often in these lessons, says love is right up there with awesome or cool as uh, some of the most overused words in our language today. Love, as Paul speaks to it today, love as Jesus speaks to us, is not about affinity. We love a ton of things. I love a good steak. I love to sit on the beach and read. I love my wife. I love my daughters. I love my grandkids. I love my sons-in-law, don't want to leave them out, but I love differently for each of those. And so it's not a matter of affinity. It's not a feeling. It's not even a preference. It is rather a matter of obedience. Obedience to Jesus as our Lord, love one another. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's what Paul says to us in this lesson today. Look at all of the nurturing words that he uses in the second part of this passage. They are woven in here. Paul understood it. Peter understood it. David understood it. All of the great leaders understand it. It's about loving one another. The challenge of that is 
if I'm going to love you, I have to be vulnerable with you. And many of us don't want to be vulnerable. If I'm going to love you, I have to trust you. And many of us don't want to take time building trust. If I'm going to love you, I will cultivate compassion with you. And that takes time. And many of us don't want to do that. Don't chastise. Don't convince. Don't judge. Just no matter what, I'm going to love you. Paul said this. Jesus said this. What about you and me? When we share the love of Christ, we are acting as responsible disciples. We are responsible to God to share love. And reaching out to others is tricky. How much do we reach out? How often do we reach out? How do we re reach out? How do we give ourselves to others? That's, that's challenging. Because we're so busy about so many things. Martha, 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 you are so busy about so many things, Jesus says. But Mary has chosen the greater to sit and to learn and to love. We should take seriously our privilege of being entrusted with the gospel. And we should take seriously our privilege of sharing our gospel story. The family language, the nurturing language of this text suggests that a church is also a complex and wonderful community. God loves the church. For in the church lies the potential for the kingdom. The church holds the potential to make disciples, to tune our hearts into worship, to teach us how to give, to teach us how to live, to teach us how to share hospitality. The church offers all of that and so much more, yet... Uh, the church is also filled with human beings who often disappoint us and even fail us at times. Paul and his friends did their best at Thessalonica. They worked in the face of strong opposition. They faithfully carried the gospel to those with whom they met. They taught and they gave selfishly, but above all, more than anything else, they loved. They didn't defend their work. They didn't hold their work over the heads of others. They didn't judge others. They encouraged and comforted and nurtured. And this was a gift that lived long beyond their departure. But Paul's group did something else, something we should notice. They cared for the church as gently and as lovingly as a nurse as gently and lovingly as a parent, as gently and lovingly as God. In recent days, cleaning out some of my mom and stepfather's belongings, there are several pictures of me holding our girls. And uh, in with both daughters, there is that picture of me asleep in my recliner with them on my chest asleep as well. That's the picture I have of how God loves us. I, I am 
resting in the arms of God. And God is laid back in his recliner and resting as well. I know that's a that's a little bit of a human picture of God, but that's a picture that I resonate with. And that's how I know God has cared for me through my years. God has held me tightly and rested while I rested. How do you love your church? How do you love your community? How do you love the people you don't even know? God's love is a gift freely given. And so let us give as God gives. Let us love as God loves. Quite a challenge. One way of getting into this passage is to make a list. Give your people three minutes to make a list of everybody that loves them. Name names. Don't just write kids, grandkids, aunts, uncles. Write names. Uncle Buddy, Aunt Alice, Daughter Jamie, Daughter Katie. Write down the names of those people that love you. And at the end of three minutes, ask them to strike through people on that list that they don't love. My hunch is no one will strike through any name. And they will be encouraged in the moment. All the people that love them in the world. If you haven't guessed, today's lesson is about love. I'm sorry, Jim. One more time, you got to go with it. In verses 1 through 5, Paul talks about loving fellow believers. Paul talks about a legacy that he's giving, and that legacy is love. And what seems to be most important to Paul is sharing the gospel in love. And what made Paul's message so authentic, so genuine, is that many of them knew his love for them. And then in verses 6 through 12, Paul gives us two metaphors of a nurse and of a parent and says to us that regardless of what happens, if we love like this, we will continue to grow in love for one another. It's important to take seriously the gift of the love of God, this love that is entrusted to us. And it is pleasing to God that we love others. If we accept this gift, how then are we to deal with individuals how then are we to deal with people inside the church that we may not like? How are we to deal with people outside the church that we might not like? You already know the answer. Mother Teresa would say, love them anyway, serve them anyway, lead them anyway. Uh, these verses are a continuation of chapter one. So you may want to go back and look at chapter one. It extends the thanksgiving Paul has for the church. And it is a continuing appeal to love one another. I love you, Paul says. God loves you. Let us love one another. Now notice, Paul doesn't push his authority on them. Paul doesn't berate them. Paul doesn't debate with them. Paul doesn't brag about himself and tell all of his accomplishments. Paul doesn't argue with them. 
Paul doesn't make anyone an evil monster. He simply loves. And part of this is by asking questions. Paul says, do you remember? Sorry about that. Do you remember when I came to you? Do you remember how I loved you? Do you re remember the appeal I gave to you? Paul asks questions and good questions. And so when you are confronted with people that you really aren't sure of, that you really don't know if you can love, that you really are not sure how to deal with, ask them a question with sincerity and genuineness with love and gentleness. So I'm curious, what brought you to believe that way? That's a great question. Help me understand what that means to you. Another great question. The world is swirling around us in so many ways these days and rather than get into the debate rather than put yourself more superior more than make them evil and you good more than bragging on your own faith just ask good questions here's what i've learned I am not going to change someone's mind. S someone who has developed a belief system, someone who is locked in to what they think, I'm not going to be able to change their mind. So I'm going to have to love them in the midst of what we're doing. I'm going to have to learn to love them as we do life together. As you enter into this political season, there are going to be people you don't agree with. There are going to be people in your own family you don't agree with. There are going to be people you want to say, "How I've known you for 100 years. How, how have you changed all of a sudden? Actually, it hasn't been all of a sudden. But rather than any of those kinds of hierarchical positioning, just ask questions. Help me understand how this works for you. Help me understand when you got that belief. I'm curious what that means for your life. Any of those kinds of questions, they're gentle, they're nurturing. And it challenges the person you're in conversation with to think. And more often than not, they won't be able to respond. To which you can say simply, I love you. We may never agree on anything else, but this I want you to believe in. I love you. And that's all you need. Jim, the Beatles said it best. Love is all you need. It's as simple and as complicated as that. And so let me close with a line or two from a poem by Walter Brueggemann from his writing Dreams and Nightmares. Last night... As I lay sleeping, I had a dream of peace greater than I could imagine. And as I continued, suddenly my dream turned into a nightmare of fear greater than I could imagine. And when I awoke, I found you still to be God, the God of love. 
Let's pray together. Lord, I'm so grateful that love is an overused word. I'm so grateful that it's more than just an emotion or a feeling. I'm glad that head and heart have to come together as we love one another. So help us, God, as we live to live as Jesus, to love as Jesus. But we pray in his name, giving thanks to God. Amen. Hey, everybody. I hope the ghost of my new background wasn't too distracting. I'm going to try to figure out how to make that work a little bit better. But send me some comments. Shoot me some emojis. Let me know how you're doing. And hey, don't forget this. Love one another. And Jim and the rest of you, till I see you again, keep on rocking out there. Bow in the Beard, Center for Christian Education. I'll see you next week.